second we have one more video to start off with uh one second here just to set the theme of jewish women as we've been talking about everybody and thank you all for coming out for another rabbi landis session first of all a sound check can everybody hear me okay yeah see if you shakes nods maybe maybe not okay yeah okay um that's good to know and uh okay so we look like we are all set all my settings look right and if not i'm sure nomi will tell me and she'll come in and fix it but uh thank you all for coming to attend with us tonight another rabbi landis session tonight's session is a continuation of the life and lives and legacies of the jewish queens and our session for tonight specifically is about uh, Salome, or uh, Salome Alexandra, she's often called, Shalom Sinan Hamalka, she's called in Hebrew, and she may or may not be a familiar name to you, but uh, if she is not, you will see that she is extremely significant, especially with us heading into Hanukkah in just a little while, just over a month. So you'll see how this is a very apropos story that fits right into Hanukkah, and we're going to give a little bit of background to Hanukkah so we can understand it. So with no further ado, let us delve right in. So I, I don't think for a minute that anybody here ever visited the state of Israel before it was known as the state of Israel, a.k.a. Uh, mandatory Palestine, or as I would say, mandatory Israel. They call it mandatory Palestine. I'm sure you've all heard from me many a times that uh, the name Palestine was the name thrown onto the country when the Romans wanted to de-Judaize the country and de-Judaize the land. And uh, that stuck until 1948. But uh, I don't think anyone here visited the country during that time. 
But had you, you would have noticed that there was a street just off of what we now call Kikar Zion or uh, Kikar Zion or Zion Square, uh, right there downtown near Ben Yehuda, where King George, Jaffa, where they all meet with each other, what's also called the Downtown Triangle. And there was a street there in the times and the for the 30 years or so that that England controlled the area. Uh, that there was a street there known as Princess Mary Street. Now, I don't know a lot about British history. I'm not a British historian. I only really know about where it intersects with Jewish history. But one thing I know is that in 1948, when the country was taken over by the Jews, became the modern day state of Israel, that most of the British names were changed to Jewish names. Now, there's some glaring exceptions like King George. I don't know why King George was left as King George, I guess, because it was the main thoroughfare. But right off of King George, Princess Mary Street was changed to Rehov Shlomsion Hamalka or Salome the Queen Street. Now, obviously, this is a very this is a very prominent street in downtown Jerusalem. Whoever this Princess Mary was, was probably some significant British history. Why is it that when the powers that be in Israel, the Knesset, whoever it was, came to deter, or that really the municipality of Jerusalem, when they came to decide and determine the names of the streets of Jerusalem, why is it that this very prominent street, they decided to keep with the theme of naming it after a woman, and the first of choice was this Shlom Sion Hamalka. I mean, I believe if we would take a survey before this class, that many of us probably had never even heard of Shlom Sion Hamalka or Salome Alexandra, as she was referred to in Greek. Um, I mean, maybe maybe uh, some people have some minor Jewish studies who are here with us tonight. Many of us have never heard the name unless we've been on the street. And we wonder, who is this lady anyways? <clears throat> And why is it that uh, that she gets such a prominent position in the modern city of Jerusalem, in the modern state of Israel? So let's delve in and find out. Now, Shlomsion, before she come, becomes the queen, uh, we don't know much about her early life. She is mentioned a number of times in the Talmud. And interestingly enough, not that I'm an expert in the Dead Sea Scrolls by any uh, way, shape, or form, but she is, to the best of my knowledge, the only woman mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And she, she, we don't know much about her early life. We know that she is the daughter of somebody by the name of Shetach ben Yossi, uh, and she was the granddaughter of Yosef ben Yochanan, Ishu Shalayim, who was one of the, the rabbis who led the Jewish people at the time, what we called the Zugos. And, and she was the sister of, somebody, of a rabbi by the name of Shimon ben Shetach, who was one of the leaders of the Jewish people when she was the queen. So that's some of her antecedents. But that's about all we know is the family tree. We don't know much about her. We don't know much about how she became married into the family that she became married into. Now, one interesting thing about her is like many people of this time, she has many, many, many aliases. Uh, we mentioned Salome Alexandra, Shlomsion Amalka, Shulamis, uh, uh, Shalminin, uh, Shaltzion, many different places. And, and she's known by many different things things. Now, we first meet her in the year 119 before the Common Era. So in these classes, we're slowly but surely coming uh, up into, you know, modern times, if you will, or at least the Common Era, if you will. And we meet her at the time period of the fourth ruler of the Hashemunai dynasty, of the Hasmonean dynasty. Now, quick history up to this point. As I said, this connects very much to Hanukkah, and Hanukkah is just around the corner. The history or the story of Hanukkah is that during the Second Temple, the Jews were originally during the first roughly 200 years were a vassal state to the Persian Empire. Then Alexander the Great comes in and is able to fulfill his father's dream because his father died. Philip of Macedon dies. And so therefore the son, Alexander the Great, a man definitely known for his modesty, is able to fulfill his father's dream by not only continuing with the United Greek Empire that he had built, but conquering the entire Persian Empire, which was the main empire on the block in those days. And he went on after after Persia to conquer India, Egypt, and the whole known world. But the first goal, at least of his father, was to conquer Persia. So when Persia switches hands from the Persians to the Greeks, uh, the uh, Israel de facto fell under control of the Greeks and Alexander. And Alexander was a benevolent ruler to the Jews, a whole story about how that came about. But he let the Jews basically continue to function on their own. As long as they paid their taxes, then taxes were not as absorbent. Uh, so we were, we were 
great vassal state to Alexander the Great, and that was fine. Now, as we, as many of us know, Alexander the Great did not live a long and fruitful life. He died at the age of 31. And, and uh, the problem is when you die at 31, even in antiquity, you don't have a real plan of succession in place. So essentially when he dies, his, his generals of his army, the, the leaders of his army start fighting for power and they decide to basically rule by committee and essentially divide the, ki the kingdom up into four empires. Now, for our purposes, the empires that, uh, that buffered, that, that, that came up to the land of Israel were the, an empire known as the uh, Seleucid empire uh, ro ruled by the general Seleucus. That was essentially the Syrian Greek empire. Uh, so if you imagine where Israel is, it was to the northeast, the east and the northeast of Israel. And then to the southwest, you had the Egyptian empire known as the Ptolemaic empire because the king there was King Ptolemy, spelled with a P, the P is silent. And he ruled the Ptolemaic empire to the south east of Israel, I'm sorry, the south of west of Israel, and Seleucus ruled the Seleucid Empire to the northeast of Israel. Now, the problem is that left Israel right as the line of scrimmage between these two new empires, between the Ptolemaic and Seleucid Empire. And sure enough, uh, there was always a struggle for power as to who would be superior, the Ptolemaic or the Seleucid Empire. And uh, not only that, but who would control the land of Israel, because that was the line of scrimmage. Now, during the first, give or take, 100 years of this situation, or 50 years of this situation, the Jews in Israel were under the control of Egypt, under the control of the Ptolemaic Empire, and, um, and the Ptolemaic Empire let the Jews live as Jews, similar to how Alexander the Great did. The only decision, the only, I guess, monumental decision mentioned Josephus that was made, mentioned in the Talmud as well, that was made during this time is, by the way, Ptolemy was a name like, like, like Pharaoh. It was many, many kings had the name. So we often don't know exactly which king we're talking about. But one of the Ptolemaic kings commissioned 72 rabbis to translate the Torah into Greek because he wanted to know what the Torah said. He wanted to know what was in this Jewish Bible. And uh, as the Talmud records, it was both a miracle and a tragedy that the miracle was that all 72 rabbis agreed and came up with the same translation. And what happened is Tolmai, in order to try and get an accurate translation, he didn't want the Jews to pull, pull the wool over his eyes, so to speak. He put all 72 rabbis into different rooms and asked them to give them the translation. And that was he could be sure he was getting an accurate translation. And sure enough, we are told that all 72 rabbis came up with the exact same translation with some calculated mistranslations in there. And that's regarded as a miracle. Now, I always say that's not a miracle. You put 72 rabbis in 72 different rooms and get them come up with the same idea. That's a numerical gear there. Put 72 rabbis into the same room and get them to agree, and that will be a miracle. But uh, be it as it may, that's what happened. And this was that was the miraculous part, but the tragic part is now having the Torah translated into Greek paved the way for Jews to be able to start to speak Greek. They were able to use this translation known as the Septuagint or the Targum Shivim in Hebrew to understand Greek. They can now speak Greek. And it was also in vogue to give your children Greek names. Uh, in fact, as a, as a, a sign of benevolency to Alexander, because he let the Jews survive as an independent part of the empire, that year, all the baby boys that were born were given the name Alexander. So if you ever met a Jew with the name Alexander, or in our case tonight, we have Alexandra, um, but if you ever met a Jew with the name Alexander, they're a descendant of a descendant of a descendant of a descendant of somebody named for Alexander the Great. So, so, but you know, if you could name your kid Alexander, you can name him Horkinus and Aristobulus and Antipater and Alexander, you know, any, any Greek name you wanted. And we're gonna see that many Jews get Greek Greek names. Now we might say like, that's crazy. Really? A Jewish mother gave a child a Greek name. Um, well, I am, uh, you know, Pierce Landis and we have uh, Steve Fox and Sherry Fleeter. You know, we all have English names. So what's so different then? That's, but that's where it started really until this point in history, there's no such thing as a Jew having anything but their Jewish name. Jews start getting Greek names at this time. Many of them were combined names like, uh, like we're going to meet Yochanan Horkinus in a moment. And, and that really carried on throughout history until today for those of us who have English and Hebrew names. So if you could give your kids Greek names and they can now speak Greek, uh, it was only a matter of time before the Jews started to assimilate into Greek culture. They became Hellenized. Uh, that's the term for Greek culture. They started to build Greek gymnasiums and Greek uh, theaters in uh, the country of Israel. And Greek culture slowly but surely started to seep its way in. 
And that was the case for, for several decades. Now, eventually, a war breaks out between the Egyptian Ptolemaic Empire and the Syrian Seleucid Empire. And sure enough, the line of scrimmage was the land of Israel. So the, the Syrian Seleucid Greeks, led by their now ruler, General Antiochus, uh, make their way through the land of Israel to wage war against Egypt, against Ptolemy. And uh, they force the Jews to put up their, their uh, mercenary soldiers. They, for, they force the Jews to finance the war. And uh, the war doesn't go so well. So when the war doesn't go so well, they blame the Jews as the scapegoat for why the war was not going well. And they say the reason that the war is not going well is because our Greek gods are not benevolent to us because of the, the land they're in. We're living in this foreign land with a foreign religion. We're going to stop their religion and make sure they follow the Greek religion. So at that point, Antiochus put forth a number of decrees to essentially outlaw Judaism. He made the observance of Shabbos illegal. He made the study of Torah illegal. He made circumcision illegal. He made the observance of the Jewish calendar illegal. And many of the decrees went much deeper, much more grotesque than that, because essentially his goal was to show that anything about the Jew, that the Jew claimed to be different, uh, they tried to violate and, and, and bastardize. One such law was that there was a there, there was a there's a law in the books that the night of any wedding before a Jewish bride could be with her husband, she had to be with the local Greek general. So that's how just terrible and invasive many of these laws got to totally ruin the fiber of the Jewish people. And that's what was going on. So, you know, it's, it's a funny thing about us Jews, because when the Egyptians uh, slash the Ptolemaic Empire were in charge and they let us do our thing. But Greek culture was slowly but surely seeping its way into land of Israel like the Jews. Jews couldn't trip over themselves fast enough to embrace Hellenism, to build the gymnasiums, to build the theaters, to make Greek culture a real part of their lives and to become what we now know as Misyavnim or Hellenized Jews. Like they couldn't, uh, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't become Hellenized quick enough. They couldn't assimilate quick enough. But you want to force us to assimilate? Uh, 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 we're not going to do that so quickly. And they started, at least a group of Jews uh, went into hiding and continued to practice Judaism. And so finally, where they said, you know what? Enough's enough. We're not going to sit here in hiding while the temple is laying desolate, cold, unused. Uh, Hellenism is being practiced in the land. We're going to show the world that there's still some Jews that care. And that was the beginning of what we know as the Maccabee Revolt. Now, they didn't think they could beat the Greek army. They thought they were going to get killed. But, uh, but lo and behold, through, through, a, uh, through a war of guerrilla warfare, and as we really know miraculous means, the Maccabees were able to fight their way all the way back to Jerusalem, were able to throw the Greeks out of Jerusalem. Now, contrary to what they will teach you in Sunday school, that was not the end of the war. The temple is reconquered uh, and rededicated in the first year of the war. And that's where the Hanukkah miracle happens. The oil lasts eight days. Uh, the next year, they establish it as a holiday. From that point on, we have the holiday of Hanukkah. But the war in total takes 25 years. So even though it's one year to get the Jew, uh, I'm sorry, to get the Greeks out of the Temple Mount, it's going to be another 24 years after that to get them completely out of Israel. And we're going to see that this nearly three decades of war of the Greco-Jewish wars in the land of Israel are going to bring the country in many ways to its knees and bring about many, many problems. Okay. Initially, after the success of the war, we have the Maccabees, who are the family who waged the war, essentially take control of the country. And they function as the, uh, now they are, first of all, they are priests, they are Kohanim. And the, the one, one of the brothers is the Kohen Gadol, is the high priest. And one becomes the provincial leader of the country. Now, it happens to be that it's, uh, you know, we talk about the great Maccabees, Judah Maccabee, all five brothers. At the end of the war, only one brother is alive, and that's Shimon. And, uh, you know, I just want to bring up my family tree here and, and share it with you as I'm speaking. I meant to bring it up before we started. I apologize for not doing that. But, uh, um, but at the end of the war, all the famous brothers, uh, the father, whose name is Matisyahu or Mattathias, he dies of natural causes actually in the first year of the war. It's unclear if he actually saw the rededication of the temple or not. But all but four out of five of the brothers die uh, for the most part uh, of the war uh, or as part of the war. And uh, once I'm going to give you a family tree here in a moment. Just bear with me. Bear with me here. 
you know, I played Jeopardy music, but uh, seeing as we lost Alex Trebek this week, uh, we should just uh, have a moment of silence for him. Also, was remiss in mentioning that we are still in the uh, shiva for my grandmother, Allah Shalom, for Rachel Abbas Pinchas. So this series is dedicated Le'ilu Nishmas for the elevation of her soul. Uh, may she have a beautiful, beautiful place in the Garden of Eden, and may the good deeds that we do and the Torah learning that we do here on this planet uh, serve to elevate her soul even further. Okay, so I got my, um, here we go. Sorry, almost there. Clicking on the wrong things. Okay. Almost there. I'm sorry. I, I am, uh, in many ways, an organized person, so I need to find something. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, I apologize for that. Let me just, I'm going to put on the screen and then I'll send it to everybody for us to look at. So this is the, this is the uh, Maccabean dynasty. Now the years are slightly off from, from the traditional Jewish years. Um, and we, uh, we, we can be a little bit differently. And the names are also not the Jewish names you can see. But this up here at the top, this is Matisyahu or Mattathias, uh, who is the father. Now we have the five brothers. Now, again, we have their secular names. This is brought down in uh, secular history books. But Judas Maccabeus is uh, Judah Maccabee, Yehuda Maccabee, Shimon Maccabee, uh, Yonason Maccabee, El Eliezer Maccabee, and I'm sorry, this is Yonasan, this is Yochanan. I'm sorry, Yochanan, Yonasan, right? So these are the five brothers. Now, four out of five are killed in war, and we only have Shimon who's left as the ruler. Now, Shimon is not only the provincial ruler, but he is the Kohen Gadol as well. He is the high priest as well, and uh, therefore is the uh, both the spiritual leader and the religious leader, uh, I'm sorry, and the secular leader of the country. By the way, we will refer back to that that map. I'm sorry, the family tree in a little bit, but uh, I will I will put it in the um, I will put it here in the chat box in case you want to download it on your own to have. Um, so uh, and so, I just misplaced it again. <laughs> um, where is it? My downloads. Okay, I might have sent it afterwards because I'm not finding it so quickly. Anyhow, um, so so we. We um, so fine. So at the end of the war, uh, Judah Maccabee, I'm sorry, Shimon Maccabee is the only one left. And he has the position of the provincial leader of the country as well as the high priest. Now, that's a problem from a Jewish perspective. Why is that a problem from a Jewish perspective? Because, first of all, the Kohanim are from the tribe of Levi, and that's determined already at the time of Moses and Aaron. Where do the kings, where do the rulers of Jewish people come from? They come from the tribe of Yehuda, the tribe of Judah. And therefore, you can't be both from the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah, two different tribes. Now, Shimon, when he becomes ruler, he does not take on the name king. He does not call himself king. He calls himself Nasi Lechevra Yehudi, which means, uh, essentially, that means the, uh, the prince uh, from amongst the Jewish people, from the friends of the Jewish people, if you will. And, uh, and, th and that's what he calls himself. That's what he calls himself during his whole lifetime. And the, the rabbis, so to speak, don't make a big deal about it because he's basically a, uh, a, a religious Jew. He's a good leader. And they, they kind of just let it go. They kind of roll with it and don't make a big deal about it. And but the problem arises because, first of all, it's it's not the right thing from a Jewish perspective. And second of all, it's good when you have a, a good person doing both. We're going to see it's not so good when you have not such a good person doing both. Now, Shimon has three sons. 
And uh, one son named after his father, Matisseo, one, one son named after his brother, Yehuda, and a third son named Yochanan Horkinus. Now, besides that, he also has a son-in-law. His son-in-law, I don't believe we know his name. And his son-in-law notices that, okay, you know, there's three brothers and, uh, you know, I'm not only not the oldest, but I'm not blood, as we would say in my family. So therefore, I have like no chance of, of taking over this kingdom. So you know what I'm going to do? I am going to uh, get rid of my whole family and therefore I'll be able to, um, you know, take over the kingdom. So we're already seeing a little bit of a soap opera develop here. So he invites his whole family to a party, he invites his father Shimon, he invites his brothers, and he successfully knocks off both his father, his brothers, at, or sorry, his brother-in-laws at this party. The only mistake he made is that the strongest, most powerful of his brothers was Yochanan Horkinus, who didn't make it to the party. He forgot to invite to the party, whatever it is. And Yochanan Horkinus is not at the party. He finds out about what happened. He goes there. He knocks off his brother-in-law. He uh, and he avenges his death. And he now becomes the third, probably the, the fourth of the Maccabean rulers because we had Judah. He dies with Shimon. He died now. Um, we, we had Matzeo, the father, and now we have, um, and now we have, I'm sorry, and, and Yonason was also a ruler. So we had Yehuda, when Yehuda, Yonason, Shimon, all brothers, all gone out. Yochanan is now the fourth ruler of the Maccabees. Okay, this is where we're going to see our queen of the day, our queen of the evening, Shlom Sion, is going to enter the scene. So Yochanan Horkinus starts off his his tenure as the high priest and the king as similar to his father Shim before him and his uncle and his uncles Yonasan and Yehuda before them. And he is a uh, he's a, a benevolent ruler. He's ruling like a, he's a good holy Jew. And uh, you know, all is good. But our sages tell us that at the age of 60, he abandon traditional Judaism and becomes a Sadducee. Now, if you remember back to the great fights in Jewish history, we talked about the Sadducees and the Tzedukim were this group of Jews who were just kind of getting their start at the time. And they didn't believe in the tradition of the rabbis. They did. They were trying to really, um, they were trying to really dethrone the rabbis or, or, uh, or do away with the rulership of the rabbis. So they argued with the, with the teachings of the rabbis. And they said, we're, you know, you can understand the Torah just by looking in the Torah and reading the words of the Torah. You don't need the rabbis, you don't need commentaries, forget about the rabbis. We're going to, you know, we'll get rid of these guys. So Yochan Horkinus, through a whole swing of, of events, switched his affiliation from being a Pharisee or being aligned with the rabbis to being a Sadducee and being aligned against the rabbis. And it's on him that the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos says, uh, which means don't believe in yourself until the day you die. Because here we have Yochanan Horkinus, who is a righteous guy, the first 60, year, 60 years of his life, and at the age of 60 becomes a Sadducee and ends his life as a Sadducee. And, and we're going to see here, changes the policy of the country to follow that of the Sadducees. So that's our friend Yochanan Horkinus, the fourth Hasmonean ruler of the Hasmonean dynasty. And uh, it, it's not looking too good at this time. Now, when he switches the policy to, to align himself with the Sadducees, all the rabbis uh, run for their lives, essentially. Uh, we have uh, Yeshua ben Prachia, who's, who's, who's the head rabbi. He runs into hiding in Egypt. And we have Shimon ben Sheptach, who runs into hiding uh, and is hid by his sister. His sister is Shlomsion Hamalka. Now, what does Shlomsion have to do with this whole story? Here's what's really interesting, because she's the brother of one of the chief rabbis. We see that she has a benevolence to the rabbis in the position of the Pharisees, even though the kingdom is not that way. But we see something that is very interesting, and that is what? We see that she is married to somebody by the name of Yehuda Aristobulus. Now, who is Yehuda Aristobulus? Yehuda Aristobulus is the oldest son of Yochanan Horkinus, of the king, right? And he is the heir apparent to the throne. And not only that, but we're told by Josephus, he's a Sadducee. 
So here you have this crazy situation where you have this very righteous woman, the sister of the chief rabbi, the chief Pharisee, and her husband is, is, a, is the heir apparent, is the prince of the Sadducee ruler. And, you know, you wonder how these shidduchim come about. You know, it, it, it's hard to understand on many levels. Now, what, what happens here, the, you know, the soap opera gets a little bit more interesting that, that when Yochanan Horkinus uh, towards the end of his towards the end of his rule, he wants his wife to uh, he wants his wife to take over, but uh, Yehuda Aristobulus wants to make sure he comes to power. So what does he do? He imprisons his mother. He imprisons his brother, whose brother's name was Alexander Yanai, and he has a younger brother who initially he uh, initially he's allied with his younger brother, but even his younger brother he thinks betrays him. So he even eventually has his younger brother killed as well. So the soap opera goes on and on and on. Now Yehuda Aristobulus dies actually not of being assassinated or murdered like many people at that time, but he dies of some sort of sickness. He was a sickly person, and he dies of a sickness. At which time Shlom Sion has her brother Alexander Yanai freed from prison, and she has him perform what's known as Yibum. Yibum is often translated as Levite marriage. I don't think anyone here knows what Levite marriage is, so we'll just call it Yibum. We'll stick to the Hebrew. Essentially, what Yibum is is it's, it's a mitzvah in the Torah. If a woman becomes widowed in a child childless state before she is free to marry whomever she wants, she has right of refu- right first right of refusal in the family that she was married into. If she chooses to stay in the family, the uh, rite of Yibam is performed, meaning the, uh, in, in, in what is usually the case, the oldest living brother marries his sister-in-law, and she therefore can stay in the family, and the name of the brother can be perpetrated on. Uh, if she chooses to refuse to be part of the family, a ceremony known as Chalitza is performed, an unchewing ceremony, and she is sent off to marry whomever she would want to. So Shlom Sion has Alexander Yanai freed from, uh, from prison, and the same day performs Yibum with him, and he is propelled to be the king. So he goes literally from being in prison to being the king in the same day. And yes, he is in fact also a Sadducee. In fact, he's more of a Sadducee than Yochanan, than his father was. Many think that, many, that, that part of the way that, uh, that, that Yochanan was influenced to become a Sadducee is because his children were already under the influence of the Sadducees, and they helped to influence him. But Alexander Yanai is a Sadducee par excellence. So we now have him as the ruler of the Jewish people in Israel. He takes on the role of being high priest also as a Sadducee, and he doesn't have any qualms about taking both positions and doesn't even call himself Nasi Lechevra Yehudi as his predecessors before him, but he all now calls himself the king of Yehuda. The king, he calls himself the king now as the uh, high priest. He's the high priest and he's the king. And this is our situation now. So we have this crazy situation that we have this Sadducee ruler who's also the high priest. He's married to this righteous woman who's hiding her brother, who's a chief opponent of her husband. Like, that's the soap opera we have going on here that we're about to tell the story of. I'm going to pause now for any questions at this point just to, uh, you know, clarify if I have missed, uh, you know, not made anything clear. Uh, yes, Deanne, uh, that Yana, I was into Yana, was in fact a Sadducee. Uh, any other questions at this point? Okay, then let's just, uh, let's keep going then. And feel free to type your questions into the chat box, or um, or you can uh, save them till we pause again for station identification. So the soap opera continues. You now, with Alexander Yanai making the Sadducean policy, the official policy of the country, even more so than his father, he goes into an out-and-out civil war with the rabbis, kills hundreds of rabbis, and, uh, and uh, many rabbis had to f- flee for their life. We're told of a, of, a, uh, of a crazy story in the Talmud that one of the 
services that we do on Sukkot is known as the Nisu Chamaim, is a water libation. And we only know about that from the oral tradition. And the Sadducees, again, denied the oral tradition. So when Alexander Yanai came to perform the water libation in the, suk- in the, in the temple on Sukkot, he poured the water on his feet as opposed to pouring it on the altar. Luckily, it was Sukkot, so every Jew standing in the courtyard had a weapon in hand, had their esrog in hand, and they pelted him with their esrogim. Tens of thousands of esrogim came flying at him, and uh, I don't know about you, but getting hit with, uh, you know, I don't know, 10,000 lemons on steroids all at the same time was probably not too comfortable. He calls his mercenary troops into the temple, and somewhere up to uh, 20 to 30,000 Jews were slaughtered in the temple on that day. So that is the situation we have have here with, uh, with the rulership of Alexander Yanai. But Shlomsil looks for every opportunity she can find to try and appease the situation, to try and re-ingratiate, uh, re-ingratiate her brother with, with her husband, and to see if she can put an end to the civil war. And there's one such situation that the Talmud tells us that uh, that they were at a banquet and nobody knew how to lead the grace after meals. That's how ignorant the people became at that point, because no rabbis were around to teach. The rabbis were all in hiding. And uh, they realized they had to say the grace after meals, they had to say the Birkat Hamazon. No one knew how to say it. So Shalom Sion says to her husband, to Alexander Yanai, well, if I bring my brother out of hiding to lead us in the Birkat of Muslim, will you kill him? And, she said, and he says, no, we'll let him live. We'll let him survive. So Shimon ben is able to come out of hiding for a little while and able to start to make some repair. A little bit later on, the fight flares up again. Shimon ben has to go back into hiding and, uh, and you know, goes back and forth like this for a few times. And finally, 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 towards the end of Alexander Yanai's life, a true peace is made between Shimon ben Shetach, the chief rabbi, and himself. And at least the last few years, the, uh, the rule of the, or the influence of the Sadducees starts to die down. Sh- Shimon ben Shet- Shetach is able to retake over the Sanhedrin. He's able to take over the temple once again, put a Pharisaic priest in the temple, uh, put rabbis once again in charge of the Sanhedrin. And we see that the last few years, uh, we see that the last few years that the Sadducees start to take over again. Finally, Alexander passes away. At the time, his heirs, his children, are only about six or seven years old. So he asks for his wife, for Shlom Sion, to take over rule of the country. And therefore, she becomes the first uh, female regent of the Second Commonwealth. If you remember from the past few classes, we, we, uh, we noted a number of female regents during the first Commonwealth. None of them were that great. Now we have a wonderful woman who is the regent of the Second Commonwealth, hence giving her the name Shlomsion Hamalka, Queen Shlomsion. And under her rule, she is gives carte blanche to her brother, Shimon ben Shetach. He is able to completely squash out the Sadducean influence in the land of Israel. And it's going to make a few flickers again, but it's basically going to go, go completely away from this point forward. And she's able to make the rule of the Torah, the rule of the Talmud, supreme in the land. And the, and the, the rule that, um, and the rule of, of the Talmud, the rule of the rabbis, that becomes the supreme rule of the country at that time. Now, the problem that we're going to see is that after she passes away, that her two sons, whose names are Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, or Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II, have an out-and-out civil, civil war for rule of the country. The, we're going to see that Hyrcanus is going, or really all of them, are going to appeal to the Romans as the Romans become more powerful for aid. The Romans are going to eventually come in the country, first under the rule of Pompey, then under the rule of Mark Antony, then under the rule of Julius Caesar, then under the rule of Augustus Caesar, you know, during that old time of Roman history where they were uh, shifting uh, pretty quickly. But be it as it may, at this point, Rome is going to be in the country and Rome is going to take over. And it's going to be, uh, you know, the beginning of the end till the temple is destroyed. But 
What is really significant about what Shlomsion Hamalka, what Shlomsion does to the Jewish people? And that decade plus that she's able to rule, still partially under her husband when her husband is still alive, and then totally after her husband passes away. She's able to fortify the rabbis and fortify rabbinical leadership so much so that when her sons take over, who unfortunately go in the way of her husband, the rabbinical influence is going to be so strong that we're going to see the successors of, of her brother uh, as people like Hillel and Shammai, who are going to be able to take Judaism and make it into a state within a state. In other words, there's going to be the separation of church and state or the separation of synagogue and state after her children take over and under the rule of Hillel and Shammai. And Judaism from that point over is going to function as a state within a state. It's going to be a separation of synagogue and state. The Sanhedrin is going to essentially be powerless from that point on. And what she did essentially was through her leadership was able to pave the way so that Judaism could be a religion separate of a state. You know, those of us who are alive today, we look at the past 2,000 years of the Jewish experience, and we think of ourselves as a, we're a religion, we're not a people. But that's not what we are. At our core, we are a people. We are the nation of Israel. That's really what we are. But Shlomsian Hamalka, in her wisdom, saw what was coming down the chute, and she said that something has to change. We have to pave the way for change for the Jewish people, and we have to make it that the Jewish people will be able to survive even without a state, because her assessment of the situation, and rightfully so, was within 100 years after her taking leave of the world, there would be no more Jewish state, and there wouldn't be a Jewish state for 1,900 years, and even when the Jewish state came back 1,900 years later, it would be a Jewish state in population, a Jewish state in character, but the synthesis of the Jewish religion and the Jewish state have yet to exist in the Jewish uh, in the Jewish country, in the modern day state of Israel. As we know, there's total, uh, for the not, not total, but for the most part, there's separation of synagogue and state in Israel. Uh, the Knesset is not the Sanhedrin. It's not a Jewish uh, rule body, but that's not the ideal. The ideal is that it is a Jewish state, religion and state and all. But so I'm seeing, seeing that we have to figure out a way to, to survive in exile, she made the policy such in her time period that the rabbis during her time and after her time could pick up the situation and create a uh, Jewish country that existed without a state. In other words, a, st a, a stateless people, a landless people to really make us a people that could survive in exile. I have often quoted, and many of you have probably heard it from me before, the famous book, The Jew and the Lotus, which is a, uh, an account of when the Dalai Lama uh, requested an audience with all the leaders of the major Jewish parties. Uh, they had the leaders of the Orthodox movement, conservative movement, reform movement, the, the heads of, I don't know, United uh, United Jewish Federations, uh, B'nai B'rith, who, uh, I forget who all was part of the meeting, but he convened a, leading, a meeting of Jewish leaders. What was the issue? He said, my people, the Tibetan people are in exile, like you, we're people without a land. And I see that my people are already losing their culture. They're losing their religion. You know, I think Michael Stipe and REM already wrote a song about us called Losing My Religion. And, uh, you know, we're starting to really forget who they are. How have you people survived in exile for over for almost 2000 years? How did you do it? How did you, how have you done it? Now, what's even more miraculous about this, this engagement between the Dalai Lama and these rabbis and the, and, the, and the Jewish leaders is that the Dalai Lama convened this meeting 30 years into the exile of the Tibetan people, asking the Jews who we have preserved our religion for 2,000 years in exile. He said, how do you do it? Well, I don't know if they told him the story of Shlom Sion Amalka, but they should have, because a lot of our success in exile, first of all, it's in part, it's a guarantee from the Almighty. We're already told in the Torah and from Moshe that it's a guarantee, but at least structurally making it happen, a lot of the thanks for that and a lot of the kudos for that goes to none other than Shlom Sion Hamalka. So I believe that's the reason that when the municipality of Jerusalem came to name the streets of Jerusalem, once it was taken back under Jewish rule in 1948, that that very prominent street to hold the name of a prominent woman, the woman they choose was not Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, who are all wonderful, was not Devora, was not Yehudas, was not any of these other wonderful Jewish women that came before her, but none other than Shlom Sion Hamalka, because they realized that it was the through the subtle way, through the special way of doing things, that Shlom Sion Hamalka was able to, to 
take care of matters when her husband was still alive. And then, and then furthermore, it's really, uh, really orchestrate matters when she was queen, that quite possibly that's what saved the Jewish people during the 1900 years of exile that we went into and made it that we today can have a modern state of Israel and even have a Rehov Shlom Sion Hamalka, have a Shlom Sion Hamalka street. So I believe that is the reason that when they were deciding on um, when they were deciding on the names of the streets of Jerusalem, they picked Shlom Sion to have the very uh, esteemed name of having that name right off of Zion Square. Okay, questions, comments, concerns, good jokes, good stories. I see Joanne typed in a story, a uh, question here that this is all in the Apocrypha, correct? I'm not exactly sure because I'm not an expert in Apocrypha. Um, Apocrypha is the Greek name for the biblical books that existed in the time of our prophetic writings but did not make it into the Bible. Uh, the Men in the Great Assembly, essentially right before Alexander the Great, canonized the 24 books of the Bible, many other prophetic works at that time uh, that did not make it in. We know of those books is the Apocrypha. Apocrypha can also often refer to books that the Christians refer to as part of the Old Testament, but are not part of our Tanakh. So I believe this, these stories are addressed in the books of the Maccabees and the, in the, uh, which, which are what we again call the Apocrypha. I'm not exactly sure, but it's definitely talked about extensively in Josephus and, uh, and in the Talmud. So, so that's, uh, that's our sources for the stories that we have covered here tonight. Um, okay, any other questions, comments, concerns, good jokes? Okay, so with no further ado, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring up the schedule for our, uh, for our next few weeks. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, hold on one second. Where is the schedule? Okay, here it is. So this is our schedule for the next few weeks. We have three more, three more uh, lectures in the series. Uh, uh, next week we'll be talking about Helena, who, if uh, Shlomsion was an early queen in the Hasmonean dynasty. Uh, Helena was sort of at the end of the Hasmonean dynasty. So you can see tonight we already painted the picture that the Hasmonean dynasty started off great, ends off, you know, this time it's not so great. We'll continue next week and see how it really goes down the hill until the time period of, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up the queens here. Next week is Helena who's a righteous queen. She was a righteous convert to Judaism at the time of the Hasmoneans. But then we're going to have Bernice, who's going to be towards the end of the uh, Hasmonean Empire and show what happens towards the end of the Hasmonean Empire. And we'll wrap up our series in three weeks with Judith, who is a, uh, he's, she's the book of where we started, the Queen of Sheba. She's another Ethiopian queen. And that's where we will end up. So that's our next few weeks. The series that we are planning following this series is, uh, is going to be a program known as uh, Coffee Talk with Rabbi Landis. We premiered a, a little bit of the style and the Shabbos project last week, and uh, that will begin the on December 8th. So look forward to that series, and we're looking for any feedback we can have for that series. But uh, okay, that's what we got coming down the chute. And um, any, any last uh, questions about upcoming programs or anything before we wrap it up? Okay. Well, I thank you all for coming. I thank you for listening. If there's any follow-up uh, later, feel free to send me a message and I wish you all a wonderful evening.